Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? We have uh, a day of fantasy and escape on Double Feature. Yeah. <laughs> my, uh, my name is Eric, your name is Michael. I think for a lot of people, this show is actually their escape. Their fantasy and escape. A lot of people listen to this, listen to it at work, at a job, perhaps they don't like because they didn't listen to our... Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross show. God. Well, you know, sometimes you got to be places and you need two That's people true. to no, keep you sense. company. And As long as, I mean, I'm just going to chalk up what you just said as I am many people's fantasies. Uh, the films we're going to do are Willow and Mirror Mask. Yep. Plenty of fantasy, plenty of escape. What else? Plenty are we of spoilers, have? plenty of chapters, plenty of... Uh, people know how to use chapters, right? Yeah. You just go up in the thing, you click and you go and you pass the movie you haven't seen. Or you hit the skip button on your fucking... Everyone's listening to this on an iPhone. Everyone is listening to this on an iPhone. It's not true. Here comes the hate mail. <laughs> My Rio Zen Bravo doesn't support chapters. Wah. So we're going to spoil both of the movies. You yep. can skip to the end where we give you our email address so the people who work at <laughs> Rio can send me an angry email. Willow is, uh, I believe, also known as Warwick Davis's Adventures in Babysitting. Is yeah. that correct? <laughs> it's, um, it's pretty similar to that, yeah. It's a film by Mr. One, Ron Howard. Yeah. Who uh, has essentially never come up on our show before. Well, Ron Howard, I mean, originally, if we're going to go way back, Ron Howard was Opie in mm-hmm. the Andy Griffith show. That's going way back, but I think that's where you start, right? Yeah. I mean, he was he was the young kid. I think he had a brief, uh, he had a role in the Music Man film, mm. and he was a child star. Sure. And then uh, he came into adulthood with Happy Days. Right, right. He was a big cast member on Happy Days, and then he fell into the Corman camp. So we're still talking about acting at this point. He's yeah. not even doing any directing. His directorial debut was actually for uh, New World Pictures with uh, Roger Corman. Sure. When um, he did the sequel to Eat My Dust, he directed Grand Theft Auto. Okay, yeah. Uh, and that was kind of his first foray into the field of directing. And since then, he's done a ton. Mm. I mean, Willow is still early on, but he went and did The Grinch. And I think right now, he's most notable for Arrested Development, right? Probably. I mean, I don't know. In the last uh, 10 years or so, he did, well, there was Ransom, right? right. There was Apollo 13. There was, uh, Frost Nixon was actually pretty fucking good. I was watching it uh, right in that period where I was watching a bunch of the political you know, Oliver Stone, sure. fucking awful pieces of trash. By comparison, I mean, it was amazing, Michael. Let yeah. me tell you, it was amazing. There wasn't a single fucking conspiracy in the whole thing. It was just a portrait of several people's lives. Wow. Their conversation together. But uh, he did those really popular Da Vinci Code movies. Sure. He's a, a fairly, um, one of those directors whose work is so well known I'm surprised his name isn't more well-known. Well, and that's the thing, is these are all films that I know of and I know have gotten, you know, people like them. Mm-hmm. I just haven't fucking seen them. Yeah, right. They just don't end up in front of me. Thanks, Double Feature. Well, and then Willow. Well, then Willow, exactly. Also an important film of note in his, uh, well, we would believe anyways. An I would believe. Well, it's, it, it's, he's working with George Lucas. That's important. Yeah, George Lucas is a guy who did some stuff. <laughs> Um, George Lucas was involved in Star Wars, and he was involved in Indiana Jones. Yes. He was involved in THX. He was involved in THX. What's the number on that? 1138? I think it's 1138, yeah. I always think I'm just making that up. Uh, that as well as, of course, uh, THX, the brand. THX, the uh, the audio certification. Sure. Um, I guess the quality control measure of... Uh, it's the deep note, right? It's right. that giant note you hear in the theater before the movie starts during the production credits that uh, affects so many different areas of your body. (laughs) So very many. So George Lucas was credited with the story of Mm -hmm. Willow. Uh, I was I was paying very close attention to the opening credits and all I saw was story by George Lucas. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, I'm always interested in what George Lucas actually does. He has the uh, the strangest credits for things. You know, his name gets tagged onto all these projects and then you find out he doesn't direct or he didn't write the screenplay. But then you see all these photos, and I mean, he's there day in and day out on Empire Strikes Back, on Return of the Jedi, and you're wondering, well, 
hold on a second. What is what is he doing there? Why isn't he directing? Yeah, where's his hand in all of this? Yeah, but you know, let's take a little George Lucas detour for a moment because I want to talk about some of the stuff he's done. Uh, and this movie in particular, you know, we don't talk about a lot of uh, a lot of effects houses very yeah. often unless it gets really culty. But uh, this is Industrial Light and Magic that did Willow. For a second there, I thought we might have a, a double feature of Industrial Light and Magic, but that's not the case on yeah. Mirror Mask. ILM is, it's part of Lucasfilm. It's uh, along with, you know, LucasArt and THX came out of that sure. too. But these are all things that what you definitely can attribute to Lucas is he created, he pioneered a lot of effects yeah. based on his own need to do things. He wanted to put stuff in movies. There was no technically feasible way to do it. So he came up with companies to invent the ways to do those things. And it's pretty amazing. And that's where... You know, when you start to see, uh, in a lot of movies, you'll see mixing was done, you know, at Skywalker or through Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm will have some kind of credit in something George Lucas has nothing to do with at all, just because they have the facilities, they have the production companies, they have the effects houses. And Industrial Light and Magic is part of that. And, you know, that started with the original Star Wars, uh, with A New Hope. And, uh, And it comes all the way today up to... You know, even more modern action stuff or fucking Confessions of a Shopaholic was, you know, uh, Industrial Light and Magic worked huh. on that. So, That's weird. yeah, you'd, you'd be amazed what you see their credits on. I mean, all sorts of different movies. They did, um, you know, we were just talking about Poltergeist, right? Yeah. So they did Poltergeist. They did a lot of Spielberg stuff. Uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was an Industrial Light and Magic thing. So they've done a lot of really amazing effects work. The thing that really interests me about ILM is the people who've worked there over the years and the stuff that, I mean, beyond, you know, Rush Hour 3, there are other things that came (laughs) out of ILM that you you wouldn't expect. Um, David Fincher, for instance, uh, worked for them for a while before he really started doing directing stuff. Yeah. But then there's, I mean, you bring up Mythbusters all the time and I mock you for it, but I watch (laughs) it just as much myself. And half of that fucking crew, I, what is it? It's uh, Adam Grant and Tori all worked for Industrial Light and Magic yeah. before that show. So you get to constantly see uh, sort of behind the scenes, you know, they'll talk about, oh, when we work for ILM, we built this and this and this. Or we were working on, you know, this commercial once and we sure. built this. And you kind of see their creative process. Right. I think that's a lot of the appeal of a show like that is yeah. you kind of see, well, this is the thought process because the, what those people are essentially tasked to do is a director or, you know, they look at a script or whatever, and it says, okay, here's a two-headed dragon. That's, uh, that's you guys. You uh, right. figure out how to put sure. one of those in my movie. Okay, I'll see you later. I got, got stuff to do. We've got these two guys, one of which is Kevin Pollock. They're about six inches tall yeah. and in every scene. Yeah, so go ahead and just figure out how we do that, and I'm going to... I'm going to set up some storyboards over here. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So they have this monumental task ahead of them and it's problem solving. Sure. You know, it's engineering. They also fucking invented Photoshop, which a lot of people don't know. Weird. Um, it wasn't industrial light and magic so much as a couple people who work there. Right. But they kind of did it as a little pet project and then sold it to Adobe who made it really the cornerstone of their fucking business yeah. model. You know, here we are uh, more than 10 versions or whatever later People are still using uh, Photoshop as its own verb, right? Things yeah, get photoshopped. True. So we can pretend we wanted to talk about George Lucas or Ron Howard, but this is double fucking feature. That's we true. wanted to talk about Warwick Davis. Yeah, really, when it comes down to double feature, if you have a film, you can look at the cast, mm-hmm. and if any of them are a legendary slasher, that's <laughs> sure. the reason we're watching the probably, movie. Probably how it came uh, to be. It's a safe yeah. bet. Uh, you can go with Kane Hodder. You can go with Robert England. You could go with Felissa Rose if she had any other movies. <laughs> so Warwick Davis was the leprechaun, right? But uh, he got a start before that, and we had mentioned a couple things that, that he had done. Sure. Oh, the leprechaun, strangely, to no one but you and I, right? Uh, is not what made Warwick Davis famous. No, actually, leprechaun is pretty late in his career. And also, I don't know if anyone even knows what leprechaun is. Right. I mean, when you compare it to these other things... You know, Leprechaun showcased Warwick Davis sure. in the same way that Willow does, yeah, really. Yeah, Willow absolutely does. You know, all of these films kind of do that that same thing. We watch them and we appreciate Warwick Davis and we get excited about that. But these live on the fringe of cinema. 
Sure. There is, uh, you know, very few people have seen them, and there's a lot of Warwick Davis. Right. Well, if you look at the titles of the films he's been in, Mm -hmm. the behemoth titles, something like Willow or Leprechaun falls far by the wayside compared to something like Star Wars. Yeah. Or something like Harry Potter. Sure. Or (laughs) even Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah, right. I mean, these are the, these are the casting credits that seem like staple films sure. for an actor, but the reality of the situation is he's in a suit for for almost all of them. It's because they never cast him in Gulliver's Travels. That's I mean, true. that's really they the give problem him a moment here. of Gulliver's Travels in Willow, and that's the closest. Is that a joke? That's get. probably a joke about his height. It's got to right? be. Does it? I think it's got to be. So he was um uh, an Ewok in Return of the Jedi. He was the Ewok. Well, yeah, I guess uh, aside from giving us industrial light and magic, and you know, Lucas Arts. <laughs> And Knights of the Old Republic and all this great stuff. Um, Shadows of the Empire. Pod George racing. George Lucas also gave us Warwick Davis. Mm-hmm. You know, he worked with him in some stuff in Star Wars. He was Walt and I think it was in A New Hope before he was kind of promoted to the role of uh, of Wicked. Yeah. Both put him in suits where sure. you, you have no idea who he is. I mean, I, I complain about that, but you get to see Warwick Davis in Willow. Right. Lucas gave him a fucking yeah. epic, and well, it just happened that no one saw it. Right. Well, Warwick Davis is actually in a show um, called Life's Too Short. Mm-hmm. It it started in the UK, and then it came over to the it's United States. It's also a States. showcase of his work. Well, and But in the show, he talks about his career, and it's, it's tongue-in-cheek, and there's a lot of facetious banter where he makes fun of himself. Sure. But a lot of it rings true, and he talks about how Willow was a film given to him by george lucas <laughs> right it was where a gift. he got to be the star sure instead of uh be in a big bear costume and then they put him in a big bear costume and life's too short and the circle is complete he uh so wicked was the main ewok he's yeah. the ewok with the orange the clothes sure essentially he's the ewok <laughs> who has clothes and that's that was always the joke on life's too short is oh you've seen willow right everybody's no no yeah. one's heard of what about, about Star, Star Wars? Wars? Yeah, that one you watched. Harry Potter? Me. Yeah. But never Leprechaun. That's right. the, that's what I'm talking yeah, about. It is never Leprechaun. I think they mentioned Leprechaun once in the uh, basically twice an episode that they list <laughs> off his filmography. Life's Too Short we talked about a little bit when we did Cemetery Junction. It yeah. is another uh, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant show. Yeah. Much in the way that The Office was or Extras. It's talking a lot about Warwick's career but also just about, you know, being a dwarf actor in sure. general, what that looks like, yeah. you know, what kind of work even comes up in, I guess, kind of the expose fashion that extras did. Yeah. You know, when you're an extra, what does, what does your day-to-day life look like? What is your actual role in film? How artistic is it? And I, I think it's a lot of the same themes of, well, sure. it's not. Well, yeah. I mean, it in, in Life's Too Short, it's really just about this guy who had some big film roles, but the reality of the situation is they weren't es- establishing film roles. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we take a film like Willow, which while iconic to anybody who owns it or who sure. has seen the poster, sure. it means nothing to 99% of the Hollywood world. Sure. Right. It's a blip on the radar. Maybe. Well, it reminds me of, you know, okay. So Penn and Teller come sure. up on our show all the time. Uh-huh. Uh, they've done a lot of really amazing work. They have a stage show in Vegas that uh, plays literally six nights a week. They, uh, they're on the Penn and Teller Theater at the Rio. They did Bullshit, which is sure. a really important show. They got a bunch of stuff on TV all the time. Where they get recognized is when Penn Jillette goes on Dancing with the Fucking Stars. Right. Or The Apprentice. Sure. Right? Those are the things because everybody watches that it's very lowest common denominator yeah. incredibly popular well, i believe i believe my first experience with penn and teller was when uh penn played drell on sabrina sure. the teenage witch sure well that that has become cult at this yeah. point that's you know that's so far back that now it has that kind of value sure. to it but it's you know it's amazing to see the staying power of that not to ever put return of the jedi in the position of dancing with the stars right but when you look at that in comparison to a, is. a niche fantasy film like Willow, sure. especially being the one with the fucking puppets, right? right. Of the Star Wars films, it yeah. is the puppet one. I mean, everybody likes Muppets, right? Isn't that sure. why we're doing uh, Mirror Mask, Mask on yeah. this show? Strangely, Warwick Davis, not the most bizarre role in this film. No, not at all. He actually holds it down pretty solid. He does. Yeah, he carries it. What? See, yeah. this is a testament to yeah. Warwick Davis. It's a damn shame because he is a fine actor. Yeah, he it's really just, is. It's just, it's... I, I mean, when watching Life's Too Short, I always grapple with the thought of, 
yeah, but you're a dwarf. And <laughs> how do you, sure. do you just expect people to just have the sheriff of the town be a dwarf and expect the audience to just swallow that? I mean, there's Warwick Davis films where that happens and I'm okay with that. Yeah, well, I am too. It's just, I, it's, it's difficult for me to get my head around Sure. That type of, because it's more of a visible difference. Sure. It definitely is. No, I mean, there's this sort of, uh, this sort of air of charity that goes with Lucas yeah. in this movie. And I don't like that yeah, either. Exactly. That's what I, that's what Where I want to avoid. Oh, good for him for, Hey, thanks for sure. making a movie with dwarves in it. That was really nice of you, yeah. George Lucas. I, I like the I way mean, it's kind of demeaning. You yeah. Know? I mean, I like the treatment. I like that it's more divided into races and less, sure. you know, I like that there's the Nell wins and the Daikinis and the mm. brownies. I also, one of my favorite things about the movie is that there's a racial slur for Nelwins and by the end of the film anytime somebody says it it like grinds your gears yeah, yeah, yeah. that people are still using the word peck even though it's absolutely insensitive oh i thought we were going to get into a conversation about kevin pollock's racist mexican accent oh, yeah. that's but, probably you know what? that's fine tony cox oddly from bad santa does nothing offensive in no. this movie he's Go totally figure. fine um, I'm offended by Val Kilmer's mere presence. I don't I'm, know why. I, I think Val Kilmer, this is this is the role that Val Kilmer is for me. Oh, no, I'm giving him a hard time. He's yeah, awesome in this. He is, but no, this, this is great. like Mad Mardigan for me, sure. that is <laughs> sure. Val Kilmer. And we see we saw him when we did Kiss Kiss Bang Bang as Gay Perry, which is possibly his best role that I've yeah. seen. But Mad Mardigan is, that's Val Kilmer. Mad Mardigan, I'm the greatest swordsman that ever lived. Give me some water. I'm dressed like a lady. I mean, he runs the gamut. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm dressed like a, a lady. Can we yeah. go back you to that? You don't remember for a... that part? Where he... Oh, oh, I remember that oh, part. Yeah. So here's the thing about Val Kilmer and drag for a moment. This fucking scene, uh, <laughs> he has to hide in drag because her husband is coming home, yeah. right? Her husband comes home and you might think you as a, as a modern free thinking citizen, might think, uh, oh, yeah, because one person might catch another person cheating and that would be wrong. And But in fact, he gets home, sees that there's a lady in the house and directly in front of his wife tries to rape her. I believe her. he says, want to breed? Want to breed. That's the that's how far it goes. <laughs> her in the statement is Val Kilmer. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a lot of irony there. But the fact that uh, he was trying to hide from... Yeah. The husband and it uh, yeah, that's fair. That is fair. Fairness incarnate. So the other thing that's important for our show is the fantasy element of this. Sure. Because we don't cover a lot of fantasies. Yeah, no, we really don't. Uh we don't get to cover a lot of fantasy objects anymore. <laughs> Hamster tokens, right? Yeah. The uh the I always think crawl. Every time this oh, happens, God. I fucking think crawl. Yeah. Crawl was a movie we never covered that is about uh I think it's about an object called crawl. It's a frisbee. Or something, it's a right? sharp frisbee. Yeah, it's a movie about hamster style. Yeah, is the but there's always one of these. Yeah, there's well, always this is, in Willow. There's a red herring hamster. Uh, we well, you get the you get the uh, hamster nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> is that what we're choosing to call those? Yes. And so uh, there's acorns, right? There's which these... immediately you know is how they're going to end the movie. Sure, that's, or maybe they're going to you're you going to forget they're there, and then at the last minute when he needs to prove that he is definitively the greatest sorcerer of all time, right? He's going to chuck a nut. And shuck a nut. And the great sorceress will turn to stone. When in reality, her kung fu is the best kung fu. Yes. And clearly. it comes down to Willow having to reach to uh, Penn and Teller for the yeah. final verdict. And we have a hamster trick from even before the yeah, nuts. Yeah, so we still use hamster style. We just don't use a, a fucking hamster token. Right. Hamster nuts. We just don't do that. Russell helps out a lot. I oh, yeah. love this part with Russell. So the turning into the animals obviously is funny or whatever, but the thing that I really like is that she claims to be young and gorgeous, but when she changes back, she's old. Right. And rather than being a gag where she just has this, you know, impression of herself or whatever, she's trying to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. She goes, oh, has it been that long? Yeah. And you get this feeling that, wow, she's been to her entire life. She's been stuck in a fucking animal's body. It's just this great unexpected reveal 
And it makes that moment kind of bittersweet because sure. she's human again. And she's obviously excited. Right. But she's also sad that she's old. Right. But then she's also kind of excited. Yeah. That she, whoa, hey, well, look she's at this. Great. What a surprise. She's great at the end of the film. Everything she is, yeah. about, I just, I it's really. It's as if she's been there the whole time. I, yeah. You don't question and that I at all. And I love the sorceress battle. It sure. just, it really, going back to when we did Dark City. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's the mental battle of sure. brain the mind beams. This is what that should have been yeah, for me. Right. I feel Old the magic. ladies tripping over a stool, yeah. lining up on their asses. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I feel it the magic. It feels like a fight, yeah. I feel the magic, and it feels really raw because yeah. they're just so hateful and so adept. Well, they punch each other out. Yeah. I mean, these are two people actually having a fight who also happen to be able to use magical sure. powers. You know, that's a great way to film this. Magical powers, especially in the fantasy of this film, not incredibly easy to use. Yeah. It requires some, you know, some chanting and what have you. Focusing. Uh, so sometimes you just you punch her in the face. That just <laughs> makes more sense. Two old women punching each other in the face. There's also a troll stop motion scene in here. And, uh, and I had to mention it because the stop motion makes us two out of three on trolls for this year of a uh, double feature. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's what Mars Attacks might have looked like had... You know, we talked about that back on Mars Attacks, potentially sure. using stop motion. But I wasn't totally sold on the trolls until we got that stop motion melty, whatever it thing. Turns into a brain dragon. Way awesome. Way awesome. So you mentioned Willow saving the day using real magic. I think there is probably nothing so great in the movie yeah. as the, you know, the ultimate. He uses real magic to disappear the baby. And this is not a uh, real magic, you know, Seth Green, Attic Expeditions, magic with a K, real magic. I mean, real, real magic. Yeah. As in, I'm going to sleight of hand this baby over here. I'm going to fucking palm an entire, I don't know how he did it. Yeah. He could have palmed the baby. I don't know. And it saves the day. That's the best thing Willow does, in my <laughs> humble opinion. I guess we move from real magic into... I don't even know if it would be magic. Mirror it's, Mask it's doesn't just deal with fantasy. Magic. It's that dark fantasy thing from yeah. Dark Crystal, right? Sure. Yeah, I guess if we're going... It is. It's the Jim Henson thing. This is a really weird thing for Jim Henson's name. Everything to about Mirror to. Mask is weird. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It's, it's weird uh, to see Jim Henson's name attached to something so Neil Gaiman. Yeah, well, we'll get to the Neil Gaiman and the, the Dave McKean stuff too, because I think Mirror Mask is far and away the best cinema study of those two i I guess i'd call them visionaries right yeah yeah. Uh, in the same light as jim henson but this kind of falls into a sort of loose trilogy yeah Uh, the same way you know just a handful episodes back we were talking about blood and ice cream trilogy and these unofficial trilogies uh what so what's up with the jim henson stuff jim henson has these uh i mean he's attached to the muppets everybody's aware of the muppets there's been the recent muppets revival But Jim Henson had these three films come out under the Jim Henson production company. Mm -hmm. Um, The first was Labyrinth, which is the one with David Bowie's penis. Right. Everybody knows about that. And then there's Dark Crystal, which Mm -hmm. fewer people know about, which is we covered it on the show a while ago. Great. Very dark, very fucked up, all puppets, very immersive. Um, And then we have this third one, which actually came out after the millennium. Yeah. It came out after Jim Henson's death. It's. It's produced by... Uh, 2005, I think. Yeah. It's produced by, I believe, his daughter. And it's part of the trilogy because it has to do with these immersive worlds that don't have fucking Kermit the Frog and Gonzo running around being mischievous. It's... Sure. They're serious adult films that venture in the same foray of the weird and... The surreal, I guess. Yeah, the surreal. Perfect. Yeah. It's, It's... the other side of Jim Henson. It's the adult visionary side that doesn't hit home with children the way that the Muppets do. It also gives people who appreciated things like the Muppets when they were younger, uh, something to look forward to as an adult rather than just the, the nostalgic look back at the Muppets because there's, there is a, a a ripe history of stuff with the Muppets. There's new films for the Muppets, Sure, but this gives you that same kind of creative force uh, but a fresh property. Sure, it's a different type of voice. And that's what the company was really trying to do when they created this. They said, hey, we have Labyrinth and we have Dark Crystal. Let's get another one of these. Let's put it out directly on DVD, which is where those other two films excelled mm-hmm. for lazy, sleepy adults who can't <laughs> haul their asses out to the... But that's it, right? Yeah, no, it's absolutely dead on. And it had a small release in the United States, but it was mostly a direct-to-DVD kind of thing. So they get these two names, who I think are the perfect names to attach something like this. 
Uh, the only thing that would prevent a statement like that is that these guys have such a style of their own that it does make it weird, like you were saying, to think, sure. oh, a Jim Henson movie. But uh, Neil Gaiman and David McKean, and I want to start with uh, Dave McKean's stuff first. He's uh, the illustrator of the two, whereas Gaiman would be the writer in yeah. this pair. And these two work together all the fucking time, and their stuff is all sorts of great. But uh, Dave McKean did something pretty recently that I think is really hip. He did this book with Richard Dawkins, which is just like, I mean, you can't escape atheism on this <laughs> show. It just can't happen. You just got a deal. But Richard Dawkins, who's largely thought of, we did uh, The Enemies of Reason yep. and uh, The Root of All Evil sure. stuff on the show. Uh, he's thought of as the devil, you know, this militant, angry <laughs> atheist. He fucking sure. wrote a children's book with Dave McKean, you know? Yeah. He's also done a lot of work in evolutionary biology, important work, uh, the blind watchmaker stuff. Sure. And he doesn't get a lot of credit for that because it's not as controversial as his other right. stuff. So people think Richard Dawkins, they think atheism, atheism which is fine by me. Yeah. I'm absolutely I'm okay sure it's with fine that. by him too, to be uh, honest. Whereas you have Dave McKean, also an atheist, and people don't think Dave McKean, atheism. No, they don't. They think Dave McKean, fear factory. Also fine with that one. Well, so he did the artwork for a lot of those Fear Factory albums, which is gorgeous artwork. Which yeah, is this he, great. I, you were showing me a bunch of the stuff. It's really these machine, sweet. you know, anatomy bone hybrid things. Um, the the big ones are the car single, uh, demanufacture and obsolete. Uh, just kind of this spine circuitry, barcode, all of that stuff. Really, awesome. but he did the Stabbing Westward album, uh, Darkest Days, and a bunch of different band artwork. Some stuff for Tori Amos. Sure. A lot of different people. As I was reading through Sandman, which we'll get to, the Sandman was done by Neil Gaiman. I was listening to Stabbing Westward the whole fucking time I was reading that, just because it seemed like those two things. Uh I don't know, the late 90s just kind of made sense to me. But so The Magic of Reality, which is the thing I want to get back to briefly, is the book he illustrated with Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins wrote it. Uh, The subtitle I love, it's called The Magic of Reality, How We Know What's Really True. And it's a children's book that rather than, you know, teaching children things and telling them there's no God or whatever, it helps instill in them something you and I call for on the show all the time, which is a system by which to judge and evaluate your own reality. Sure. It teaches kids to rely on evidence and factual material. You got it. You have a system in place. You can fall back on that system to make those evaluations for yourself. So I found this awesome interview with Dave McKean. I'm going to link to it. It'll be on uh, the page for the show on our website. And this says a lot of you know what I like about this guy. He was talking about the question of religion, right? And he said, uh, I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in God. And I don't think anything happens to us when we die. We just become worm food. Life is a distraction and I'm distracted. I'm interested in conversing with people, finding out what their thoughts and feelings are, what their beliefs are. I love to do it face-to-face in my work, and I'm not interested in making something that's completely docile, like sitting in front of the television and letting it wash over you. It's not what it's about. There's no point. There's no moving forward. It doesn't get us anywhere, and we don't understand each other better. This sounds like something I would have said on the show had I been better with, you know, the word parts. (laughs) There's no God. We're all going to die and get eaten by worms. And also, let's have conversations with each other so we could figure out more about uh, one another, humanity, and the Earth. Dave McKean. So then Mirror Mask is this movie that he, uh, his credit on this is really unique. It says he designed and directed Mirror Mask. It's uh, a movie that exists, you know, in a kind of laid back world of fantasy, especially from the opening, you know, from... The man, we were just talking about freaks, but again, it's come up the carnival. Do you wonder why we like this movie, right? <laughs> uh, in this traveling circus world where you know you're so immersed in all this fantasy stuff from the beginning, and this is Helena's reality, sure. I mean, this is where she lives. This right. isn't dream world, yeah. This is uh, she's for- day to day life. She's fortunate enough to have Bob Bryden as her father, it's true. So, there's music over this whole thing by I think his name is Ian Bellamy, he doesn't do a lot of film score stuff. He's, um, you know, he plays saxophone and he does uh, the stuff he does for this movie. I mean, it works wonders. It's the bizarre music. and strange. And I would have never in a million years know. chosen it, but who, it, it's so good. Who thinks to pair this yeah. stuff? I mean, if anything, uh, you know, it's hard to, to slap the art direction in the face this way. But if you watch this movie and just go, this doesn't feel like a movie. What What is this fucking feeling? Yeah. I mean, the art direction helps. Sure. But... 
a lot of this stuff would be, it's that great line that the Dark Crystal walked where it could be really scary. And the Dark Crystal might be a scarier yeah. film. Uh, but the music, it just, it tells you, hey man, everything's going to be fine. Right. We're just going through this kind of daydream here. Sure. And uh, we're going to come out at the end and then the movie will be over. It's yeah, very and zen. That's, I mean, that's really what the film does in spades is you have all these situations that would otherwise be horrendously urgent terrifying sure. I, I go back to the uh orbiting giants yeah right. scene where the giants are being ripped apart by this dark force and they're trying to get this box and basically it seems like if this doesn't play out the entire plan that they have set before them cannot come to fruition and it still doesn't feel like it's not going to happen it just feels sad the giants are perfect because they seem laid back themselves yeah. just in how well, that's exactly <laughs> it's it yeah it seems so sad and and dark and magical and twisted sure but still a little hopeful with a little light at the end of the tunnel what that does is lets the outside reality really become the uh you know the terror here sure and not even her reality so much as you know when the ambulance comes in the beginning right we're dealing with all this fantasy all this circus it's a show it's her reality but it's a show and that ambulance is the rude awakening it's the you know you forget that you are actually in the real world mm -hmm. she has this conversation this fight with her mother in the beginning where she's you know she's been surrounded by circus life she wants to go outside that and the only time you see outside that really is a hospital, is this danger and this emergency. Right. So it's uh, it's almost the movie trying to convince her through all of the different elements it has, all the different you know realities and faux realities and dream worlds, to tell her, hey, there's a lot of creativity to the life you're in for you to choose from, rather than just snapping back into right. desk job, ambulance, you know, kind of reality. So when Dave McKean creates that, he creates so much of it. You know, it's just pouring out of the film. It's a lifetime's work of, of art you could look at. They did a, a book called The Alchemy of Mirror Mask that has a lot of kind of in-depth, uh, you know, conceptual stuff and what they were thinking in different places, what uh, different sections of the movie were kind of calling for. But that's a great place to learn a lot about um, that art. Art being a visual medium, I won't bore people to death right. trying to uh, describe it especially with still needing to talk about Neil yeah. Gaiman. Well, we mentioned Neil Gaiman a little bit before on the show. Sure. So, uh, like I was saying, I read through Sandman. I wanted to, you know, I keep remembering back to our Stephen King show where I couldn't bring myself to read any Stephen King. Right. I just couldn't do it. I tried very hard and I didn't. And I thought, you know what? If we're going to do uh, Mirror Mask on the show, especially after doing Coraline, movies that share right. a lot of similarities, yeah. I want to know more about Neil Gaiman. I want to get him. And so he's written some books, uh, some, let's call it proper novels, as opposed to graphic novels. Right. But I thought, you know, for this stretch of whatever we're doing and whatever we might do in the future, I'm going to read through what he's known for graphic novel-wise. Well, I mean, it's fucking visual. This yeah. mirror mask is so fucking it visual. Is. It is. And so is Coraline. I mean, we're a film podcast. I think everybody can sure. let you off the hook for reading a graphic novel. Well, and being a, a Dave McKean thing, I mean, the Sandman was a place to go, you know, that falls much in line with uh, mirror mask. Sure. It's also no small task. I mean, I've been reading it nonstop for weeks. There's a ton of it to uh, to get through. Neil Gaiman's somebody who interests me because I don't feel like he's one of my favorite people of all time, but I'm still really fascinated by him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't like fantasy. I couldn't get behind anything fantasy related until I kind of found Neil Gaiman and found Coraline, just even the the beginning of that stuff. Mm -hmm. he um He's an interesting guy because he mainly writes but does not illustrate graphic novels. Sure. So he's known for, you'll hear about Neil Gaiman's this or Neil Gaiman's that, and, uh, you know, he writes the stories for this stuff, has nothing to do with, uh, with the art. The first thing he wrote with Dave McKean was Violent Cases. So they worked on that. But then, you know, he'd been working with McKean on stuff for a couple of Dave's different projects. Vertigo, DC, the, uh, the publisher that McKean does stuff for, mm -hmm. basically went to Neil Gaiman and said, you know what, we want to redo Sandman, who is one of their kind of classic superheroes really and the it was kind of an odd stipulation too they came to him and said you know what we want to redo it though we don't want we want the same sandman uh i think back to gojira and name only yeah 
So it's almost the opposite of what you what you usually say. Sure. It's not him striving to go, should I do my own thing? Can I do my own thing? Yeah. They came to him and they said, do the, the Neil Gaiman thing you do with the Sandman. That'd be awesome. Right. And so then Dave McKean came in and did all these great covers, which are really, really cool. They're incredible pieces. He, uh, you know, if you look at covers of the Sandman, they are these kind of photo collage pieces of work that don't... First of all, the Sandman is a character in the Sandman series Mm -hmm. who is not the main character, which is one of the most interesting parts about it. It's this anthology of stories, these different uh, story arcs that are all kind of loosely tied together by a central figure, Sandman, who is part of, uh, in the series, what's called the Endless, kind of these infinite ideas that are personified by these different characters. Uh So a large part of the series takes place in a dreamland, in a, a place where people are sleeping, and you see a lot of characters that kind of cross over. But it's not just about, you know, the superhero-esque Oh, here is the Sandman, and here's what he did sure. this time and this time right. and this it's time. Right, it's not the exploits of the Sandman. Right. So Neil Gaiman instead comes up with these interesting stories and concepts and uh, and puts them together using this one central character and maybe how he influenced them or what role he took. Or sometimes he just shows up in one panel and just kind of walks by. Yo, I'm the Sandman. I uh, hang out in the, the dream world here. And so the real common thread in it is that people got to know the author. They got to know, well, this is Neil Gaiman's Sandman sure. series. Neil Gaiman tells cool stories. He would go on to work with Dave McKean on other stuff, too. I mean, uh, he illustrated the adaptation of this film that he worked on, Neil, with. But Neil was himself somebody who was inspired by another artist we've talked about, Alan Moore, mm-hmm. who did Watchmen and did uh, sure. From Hell and did a lot of this different stuff that's some would say has been bastardized in, uh, into yep. movies. And so Alan Moore and Swamp Thing, and that was what brought him into comics. He said something that anytime I'm trying to convince somebody, you know, much as we do with gaming all the fucking time, that, hey, there are other artistic mediums outside of novels and films that are completely valid works. Sure. Graphic novels, I think, have their, their own place. And, mm-hmm. you know, you don't have to fight for that as hard as you used to. The works become a lot more diverse right. and legitimate. Sure. But he was attracted to the fact that you could do basically anything in this form. You could do anything in this medium, kind of the same way we like horror movies because they, you know, people hold them to such loose standards right. that you can experiment. And so that's what lured Neil Gaiman into graphic novels is he said, you know, these haven't been around nearly as long. The Shakespeare's of graphic novels may have, have not been born yet. And it gave him a huge playground to work in in kind of a, a form that was a little bit different yeah. before he eventually went on to to do some actual novels. Even the even the idea of me continuously calling them actual novels seems <laughs> insulting to me. So his style is one that's a, a little hard to pin down. You do kind of know Neil Gaiman's stuff when sure. you see it. He's got this odd sense of humor that's one of the things that really stuck out to me. Because it's dry and it's dark, and we talk about that a lot, but it's got this more kind of dry... Neil Gaiman is a little crazy uh, <laughs> element. You know what I mean? It's demented, but not in the dark sense. Well, I mean, I, I I know Neil Gaiman most vividly in recent history. Did you by any chance see when um, Amanda Palmer did the cover of uh, science fiction double feature on Craig Ferguson? Oh, wow. No, I have Moby haven't. and Neil Gaiman. No, that sounds incredible. Neil Gaiman, all he did was he stood in the back while the other musicians were playing and uh, Amanda was singing. And anybody who's familiar with the with the film, which you should be because it was on double feature and you watch every film we do, the song um, at the, you know, the kind of turn at the end of the chorus at the late night. And then there's the keyboard that goes do, do, do. <laughs> yeah. Neil right. Gaiman stood in the back facing a keyboard, looking at a wall. Beautiful. And when that happened, he would just do, do, do with one finger Love on a it. keyboard. Oh, it's great. So to me, he is an absolute nut job. Yeah, he's a, he's a pretty crazy guy. <laughs> you know, the thing that's really demented about Neil Gaiman is uh, how collected he is and sure. how, you know, if you read, he's got a blog and I mean, you know, you read through his stuff and he's really well gathered and he knows his influences and he knows his history and yet he creates these things and it's just, I mean, it kind of takes, you know, if I use a word like demented, that can mean a lot of things. Tim Burton is demented. Sure. Johnny the Homicidal Fucking Maniac is demented. But Neil Gaiman has this 
he takes these dark things and he adds some kind of cheer, some kind of whimsy to them. They yeah. become mystical. Well, it, they're, they're misconstrued as children's films. When a right. Neil Gaiman story becomes a film... It is misconstrued as a children's film. So that sure. gives you an idea of the whimsy and the innocence that it at least masquerades as. Well, it's like you were talking about things being uh, very important and very, you know, it's an emergency, but it's not that big of a deal. Sure. That painful, slow sentence coming out, just very laid back. And so that's the kind of humor in those characters being rushed and the other character pronouncing things, you know, sure. speaking his sentences really slowly, which cracks me up every time I see it. But also the riddles. Yeah, I love that the riddles great. don't work, but, oh, look over there, an idiot. Totally <laughs> works, you know. Or the way the the movie ends, that very punctuated, fucking love those punctuated yeah. endings. Just the, the laughter, what? the mutual awkward laughter, and then what? I love it. It can be mean like that, but it's in a very fleeting way. Sure. It's in a very momentary, ah, oh, don't worry about that, not yeah. a big deal. Take off. And it treats mysticism the same way. You know, all his work seems to, you know, Sandman was a lot about that too. It's mystical, but it's in a dreamland. So it plays very loose with the rules of magic. It's kind of this, uh, this surreal flowing continuity. And he tells you he's paying close attention to the continuity because of callbacks and because of interwoven stories. Sure. And that's true of Sandman and of Mirror Mask. You know, things like uh, the book of knowledge that she needs right. or having this key. There's important elements she gets early on that will be used later in that same fantasy sense of the, the hamster tokens thing we were talking about in Willow. So those rules are important, but you find out new things about the world as you go along. The world's constantly revising itself much in the same way that it did in Coraline. Right. I remember that was one of the sure. things we talked about there too. And that's why the dream environment lended it so well to Neil Gaiman and why I think Sandman was such a success because that worked so well in his style in just, uh, hey, it's dreams. Dreams have kind of arbitrary rules. Sometimes you make them up as you go along, but here are the pieces of canon that are important and do connect. That duality that's also a common thread between Coraline and, and Mirror Mask sure. is uh, something else that's important to a lot of his work. I mean, that kind of, it's almost paradoxical, the duality, especially in Mirror Mask. There's two sides to this girl. There are uh, really two different girls. And they're, they kind of become aware of each other. Mm -hmm. This takes place in a dream world. But the paradoxical part of this is that while this dream world gives Helena control, it's also the very same thing that traps her. Right. She is trapped in an environment where she has complete control. Sure. And that allows that character to explore a lot of different ideas and to learn a lot about, you know, herself creatively mm -hmm. to kind of express herself creatively in the very world that she's made by creating things by drawing up these these different designs conceptually it does a lot of that work for you and then it's up to you to just kind of play in that world right the only thing that really makes that not a not a laid-back fun thing for you to play around in is that when you look out into the other world when you see through the window sure you basically watch your life being ruined by yeah, someone who's somebody not else you. is fucking up your stuff right so that's where you know, that's where things inside the dream world are, they're laid back and they're nice and you can stroll around. But every time you catch a glimpse of the other world, you, you go, wait, fuck her. She's what, snogging boys? Yeah. Is that the, yeah. yeah. And smoking and, you know, yelling at her dad or whatever. She's fucking stuff up. One thing I didn't mention about the music before we jet out of here ourselves is that uh, Josephine Kronholm sings on that Carpenter's cover. Yeah. Um, close to you. It has the kind of the upright bass and the saxy stuff. Right. Goes in with a lot of the score and the people who put that together. But it also has these types of clock and gear sure. sounds. It reminds me of a little bit of the stuff. There's a, there's a few things on the Pins and Needles record, the Birthday Massacre record. Uh -huh. Or I think it might be, um, it's one of the Nine Inch Nails. Remi it doesn't matter because no one's ever going to find this stuff. <laughs> but you know, one thing you can find that it kind of reminded me of. You remember when we saw Mary and Max? Yeah. Pre year ender right. listener request Everybody kind of thing. Everybody chooses shit thing. Yes. There was that Pink Martini song. You remember that? Yeah. K Sera Sera. Yeah, I do. That was uh, kind of heavy, huh? It was a blast. It's sad. Yeah, you're right. It's a little sad, but a spectacular song, right? Sure. Haunting and creepy and maybe Suicidal still, and, still and still yeah. giving you nightmares. Wow, we've just ended with a downer two weeks in a row. I'm sorry, everyone. Get the fuck out of here. Doublefutureshow.com, doublefutureshow at gmail.com. We have two exciting, happy films next time. Yeah, we do. Next time we're so going... Amazon Women on the Moon. That's, that's really that's, exciting. Yeah, but then we the also other? have Videodrome. Oh. Watch more fucking film. Bye.